His name is still up in lights, Charlie Magri Sports in the heart of London's East End. This is how Champagne Charlie, as he was known, now spends the majority of his time. Born in Tunisia, he came to London aged 18 months, and it was his East End upbringing which led to his taking up of the noble art of boxing. What happened was, when I was younger, I was always, like, um, getting into sort of, like, fights and things like that. I never was scared of fighting people. And then um, I took up football. I kept getting left out because I was too small. I thought, I've got, there must be something else I could do where, uh, you know, I can do it on my own, you know? So it, then my brother took me down to the gym and it started off from there. You did very well as an amateur. You had four national junior titles and ABA light flyweight champion. And was there a lot of pressure on you as a youngster? Because, you, um, you know, you were pretty good. It's only the pressure that you put on yourself, really, I think. Um, when it boils down to, I, I, I was hard to match, you know what I mean? Like, when you get to a certain stage, you have to um, get opponents. When I was senior with the RBU, youth, they would get me in foreign opponents, like Germans, French, uh, Irish, Scottish, and things like that. Because you were so well known yeah, in this country, that's no one right. wanted to fight. I mean, they wouldn't fight me now. Well, it's a great, you left the amateur game with a great record. I mean, ABA champion 75, 76, 77, and European Junior Championship medals and all sorts. Yeah. So, who put pressure on you to turn pro, or did you just feel the time was right? Um, what it boils down to, I've done everything as an amateur, and I thought myself like, I, I didn't fancy carrying on boxing anymore, you know what I mean? I thought, um, what else can I do? And the professional game was a challenge to me. I thought, you know, that's the only way out. Mm. And you signed with Terry Lawless? Terry Lawless, yeah. Was, that, was there anyone else trying to get you as well? Or oh, I had you... a few people after me, yeah. There was loads of people after me, but what it boils down to, um, Terry Lawless had a good stable, he was local. I thought, like, you know, that's the best place to go. We had some great people in his gym, Jim Watt, Morris Hope, John H. That's right, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't an hard decision, was it? No. You made your pro debut, Albert Hall, October 77. Now, you were sort of joint top of the bill, and that's something for your professional debut, so obviously yeah. you, you know, created a good impression already. Oh, yeah, yeah. To, uh, uh, to me, like, when they, when they told me, I didn't think about it, you know. All it was, really, was my first profile. I wanted it out of the way. And, um, <clears throat> they got me a good opponent as well. Neil McLaughlin, what do you remember of that fight? Well, what I remember was he, I think he had about, cool, he had about 15 fights. And it was my first fight. He was the Irish bantamweight champion, which he was, originally, he was a flyweight, but he has to go up sometimes to earn some money, didn't you? Yeah. He was the Irish bantamweight champion, and he was a really good amateur. He was like myself. He was like a Irish international. Uh, I knew all about him, because when I was a kid, I used to follow him, you know? Yeah. And um, I thought myself as a challenge. I like fancy this one, and I done well. McLaughlin much time to recover, he's got him again. His gun shield's fallen out of his mouth and he's not going to get up, he's totally out. Not bad for your pro debut and it continued in much the same vein, for within six weeks Charlie was the British champion, a feat for which he was given a Lonsdale belt. A year or so later came the European title fight with Franco Udella, but was he ready? I rose to the occasion, uh, I really wanted it, really wanted it. And when I got in there, there was no stopping me, really, you know, I didn't care who he was. And then thinking about it afterwards, looking at his record and his background, he was a brilliant fighter. Former world champion, he was 32 very, years of age. Very good fighter. You know, he, was, he was on his... Uh, at the end of his career, but the only thing was, he defended the title, I think, around about 10, 15, 14 times, something like that. European championship champion, he was for so many years, unbeaten in Europe. So it was a good, good result. The European crown was his, and under the expert tutelage of Terry Lawless, he went on to make a successful defence against Manuel Carrasco of Spain. And again, he was tall, safe, or awkward, and he went the distance with me. But I gave him such a beating, I won every round. I, I don't know how, he, how the referee never stopped it, but um, he done really well to, to last out the 12 rounds. And it was like, 
same same pace all the way through. First round, I went at him to knock him out, and it was like that all the way through the fight. And it, it was unbelievable. I don't know how he stood up. You were fighting some really, really tough opponents, and uh, you know you were winning all the time. Then you you fought who was a guy who was going to be a future double world champion, Santos Lechia. That's right. Yeah. Um, the only bit of news I got about him was before the fight uh, was that he he's only a young boy, can't punch his way out of a paper bag, and it turned out to be the hardest fight I've ever read. He was telling you that. Terry Lawler told me that. Yeah, he told me, he said, it's just a nice little warm-up. Well, you beat him, but yeah. when you looked at his record, he was, he'd had like 50-odd fights. I beat him, but it was hard. It was a very hard fight. And when I looked at his record, I think it was 48 or 50, 50 fights he had. And he was 20 years old. So he, he weren't no mug. Do you think that took something out of you? Because after that, you were exposed a little bit. No, no, it never took nothing out of me. I was still young and fresh. I should have boxed for the world title after that. What took a little bit out of me was waiting around too long, not getting the title shot when I when I should have had it. You know, when you were at your peak. Mm -hmm. When I got it, I wasn't. I was. I was over the hill. That exposure came in the form of Juan Monito Diaz of Mexico. Charlie was on a roll, but it all went terribly wrong that night. Oh, he's got him! Right hand, Magri down. Sixth round, looking straight into his corner. And he's got up a bit early, and I don't think he quite knows where he is. He's got up too early, his legs have gone. The number one contender is going to lose his place. He's gone, he's gone. Oh, these Mexicans, what do they do? And suddenly you're looking at a man whose world title chance has just gone out of the Albert Hall. Out, counted out. First defeat ever in his career, round six. Uh, make no excuses, right? The guy caught with a good shot. I was well winning and it happens to everyone. I was trying to prove something to myself. There was a chance of a world title at a light flyweight, right? So I thought to myself, I can make that weight. Hey, and I, and, I, and, I, and I, if you look, look at the records, my weight was only, I think I was seven stone, 11 and three quarters for that fight. Mm. Just to prove that I can make the weight. Right? And that guy weighed in eight stone, two and a half. That's a lot of difference in weight. But the only thing was, making no excuses, he caught me with a good shot and I think I might have done better if I was a bit heavier. Did it knock anything out of you because you lost the next one when you fought Torres as well? Well, what happens was um, you get beat like that and you think to yourself you're going to pack it in and all that. Like, give yourself a couple of weeks and you get over it. And then um, like, I got over that bit, but the only thing was I needed a couple of more wins. Then the world title shot never came. And I got another Mexican guy. Jose Torres, who was the most awkwardest geezer I've ever fought. Treads on your toes, pinches you, nuts you, bites you, everything, you know. And he just frustrated me. I don't know how he never knocked me out in the first round, because my mind wasn't with it. Mm. But he, I went nine rounds with the guy. I demanded a return with him. Yeah. And I got that. Were you annoyed with people because they were saying, you know, Charlie's chinny, he's only sort of European meat, and did it I was upset annoyed. you? What it boils down to, people can say that, you know. I was annoyed with him because of that, um, but the only thing was they don't realise mentally what he does to you. They make you worse than what you are, you know what I mean? You get in the ring and you lose a little bit of confidence in yourself. Now, now I'm, I'm gonna, I've got a gym, I'm going to get a gym, I'm going to get some fighters, I'm going to put the confidence into them. There's a lot of fighters that have not got enough confidence in themselves, mm. and you need this, you need people to push you, especially someone like myself, I've done it all. Mm. I can't put confidence into someone, I don't know who else can. Well, at that moment in time, you, um, you'd had those couple of defeats. You, you obviously were confident because you went out to Spain and fought a guy called Enrique Cal. You knocked him out in two rounds, so that must have boosted your confidence, got it back again. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I had to prove myself. And, uh, you know, I had better doing it, doing it abroad in Spain. You got to win by a knockout out of there, so I thought myself, I've got to go out and do a good job, get myself back in there. Then there was the Torres return, so you avenge, you know, you avenge that, turn mm. that one over. I still couldn't stop him. Though. Five seconds to go. The pair of them battle it out to the final bell. That was some fight, and that was some win for Charlie Magri. Revenge. 
and people stand to applaud him. Charlie had fought his way back to the top, and a world title fight against Alonso and Mercedes was next. Surely he wouldn't let anyone get the better of him this time. One thing was in my mind, winning. I didn't think of nothing else. Nothing else. That's all that was in my mind. I was going to beat the guy. I don't care how I beat him. But, I mean, he had to kill me to beat me. And that's what happened. If you got the video or whatever of it, you only have to look at me. I'm jumping up and down. I can't wait to get started. And when I do get started, I don't stop. And it speaks for itself, you know what I mean? And you eventually stopped him in seven rounds. That's right, yeah. How did you feel that moment when you knew that was it? It didn't quite sink in properly, but um, no, it was a fantastic feeling. Yeah, fantastic feeling. Without doubt, the greatest moment of your life. Yeah, of course it was, yeah. Round seven, the eye bleeds. Hagri goes for the finish. Can he get it? And the referee is calling the doctor to have a look at it. He's calling the doctor in to look at it. It's not over yet. He wants the Adrian Whiteson's opinion. And Adrian Whiteson says he can't go on. And Britain has the world flyweight champion. Charlie is the champion. It's Champagne Charlie is my name. He's done it for Britain. 16 years we've waited for another world flyweight champion. We've got him. And his name is Charlie Magri. Nights like that will never be forgotten, and the name of Charlie Magri is in the record books for all time. But how would he himself like to be remembered? Well, I'd just like to be remembered as a good fighter. Not like, you know... I don't, I don't like them bringing up the old defeats what you've had, you know what I mean? Like, I want to be remembered as a winner. Well, he certainly will, that. Great boxer, great guy, and a credit to the game. Time for a quick break. After that, all the latest news and views in your life.